Okay, so I thought I'd start with something a little bit different today, something I've never done before. I'm going to randomly select three people and each person I'm going to give a Bible verse and you're going to do a three-minute talk impromptu. <laughs> Who is mildly panicked about that? <laughs> yeah? yeah? Be honest, hands up, if you are mildly panicked by that thought. Okay. If you're not, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but if that doesn't panic you, what does panic you? Because that's the number one fear. Did you know that? Public speaking. So if that doesn't panic you, what does panic you? Seeing the electricity bill come in in the mailbox? Does that that panic you? Being late for work? Having your boss casually say to you, can we have a quick meeting after work today? And then not give you any other information? What about seeing your mum or your dad standing there with your phone saying, what's the code? Yeah, the kid's going, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah. I've seen some people get panicked over all sorts of things. There was a guy at college who, um, he had to go and preach in a church for the first time and he was absolutely petrified. And he got up onto the stage and he opened his mouth and instead of words, vomit came out. (laughs) It was pretty bad. That's That's how panicked the guy was. Another time we were doing this big concert when I was in the army, we were doing this big concert, it was the Opera House or the Entertainment Centre or something, and uh, often in pieces there'll, you know, there'll be a solo or or something, you know, and as a French horn player I occasionally did solos, but there was this one piece and it was an oboe solo was in it. And the army used used to have this really weird thing, like if you were doing a solo, it wasn't enough for you just to play your solo, they wanted you to stand up and play your solo, like that's the guy playing the solo, right? And um, anyway, the, we're playing along and we're coming down to the, the bit where he's about to do his solo and he was so worked up about it, like he was so worked up about it. And, and you know, it's like anything in life, if you, you can psych yourself out of things, do you, you know that? You know, you can, like stuff you can normally do sometimes with no problems, but if you get, start to get head up about it, you can actually psych yourself out of it. Anyway, this guy was a perfectly good oboe player, but he had so psyched himself out that when the time came, he stood up and he cracked his first note. By that means, like, he, it, was a, it was a mispitch. And so rather than just continue, he pretended to faint. <laughs> He's kind of lying there like... <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to give you 10 for, for, like, impromptu response to that. That was, like, that was actually brilliant. I was thinking about the stuff that makes me panic. And there have always been two big things in my life. I mean, genuinely panic-inducing things where I've had panic attacks. And in the past, it used to be doctors and hospitals, right? If ever I had to go to a doctor's surgery, or if I had to go to a hospital, I would find myself getting, like, near panic attack. And I, I thought about that. What, like, why do I do that? And it was always this fear that just by going there, they were going to find something wrong with me, right? Like, even, even before I even saw the doctor, just intuitively, I'm going in there and somehow they knew there's something wrong with you, right? Ever since I've had cancer, that fear's gone away, right? Because I've already had the worst thing they can tell me and it's not a problem, right? So, so I used to be terrified. But the other thing I w- that was panic-inducing in me were elevators. And there was a reason for that, that I was trapped in an elevator when I was seven for an hour and a half, so it's kind of left me with a bit of a scar. So th- this is no joke. We will go places and um, Heather and the girls will go to get into a lift and I'll go, I might just take the stairs. And she'll go, it's 30 flights up. And I go, I need the exercise, right? <laughs> so where I can avoid getting in a lift, I will avoid getting in a lift. So there are occasionally in my role these things that were double bangers for me when people would get hospitalised and I would have to go and visit them. And I would go there, and on the way I'd be praying, please let them be on the ground floor. Please let them be on the ground. 99.9% of the time, they were never on the ground floor. So one, I'm in a hospital, and I'm already struggling to breathe. Two, I have to get into an elevator as well. And honestly, it would take me ages to come down from this type of things. So why do we panic, right? Well, 
It's thanks to this little almond-shaped part of our brain called the amygdala. Who's heard of the amygdala? Right? Now, the amygdala serves a really good purpose. It's all about survival. It's the thing that doesn't think about anything. It just triggers our fight or flight response in order to keep us safe and to keep us alive. And it gives us a big shot of adrenaline and stress hormones when it does that. So whenever we're confronted by some sort of danger, you're walking along on the bush track and a snake slithers in front of you, your amygdala kicks in in order to preserve your life. Whenever you get in your car and drive anywhere in Sydney, your amygdala kicks in <laughs> because there is danger all around you all the time, okay? Optional extras like stopping at red lights and blinkers and lanes, you know what I mean? It's, it's the, we're on high alert for that time. But as helpful as the amygdala is, it's not a very nuanced part of our brain in that it doesn't have much of a repertoire. It's not capable of higher thinking, okay? It, and in that sense, it doesn't actually distinguish a real threat from a perceived threat. And so the response we get from seeing genuine danger like a, a snake or a car coming hurtling towards us, the amygdala kicks off the same response when we get a text if we're expecting bad news or a knock on the door if we're, or something like that. It, it doesn't distinguish between a real threat and a perceived threat that we've built up in our mind. So a fire alarm goes off, real threat, your boss says, I want, to, I want to have a meeting with you after work. Your amygdala can kick in there. So it's great for survival when we need it, but not so great when we're dealing with things where we don't need the extra shot of adrenaline to help us keep going. So it's just as well we have another part of our brain that keeps things in check, and that is called our prefrontal cortex. That is the logical and rational part of our brain. So the amygdala is great. But you need to think of your amygdala as that kind of hyped up, over-caffeinated, high blood pressure friend, right? The prefrontal cortex is our more wise, mature, reasoned, patient friend. And it keeps the amygdala in check. So it works something like this. Our next door neighbour, he was an electrician. Well, he is an electrician. He's moved now. We've got new neighbours. But he put lights all down the side of his house. Now, he must have bought these lights from an airport or something, right? Because and he put them on a, um, a sensor as well. Not a light sensor, just a movement sensor. And, and all down the side of his house obviously goes right down the side of our house, but there's our bedroom and our ensuite bathroom and window. So whenever anything would go past this sensor... It would just be this explosion of light that would just come into our room. So occasionally we would leave our bathroom door open and you'd be asleep and it'd be like, it would be like, it's the second coming, right? <laughs> just, do. And so we close our door, but even then it floods in after night. Now, when you're in a deep sleep and you're suddenly woken up by this light that you know is only triggered by movement, your first thought is someone's creeping around outside the house. Right? And, and you start to panic. And my amygdala kicks in and it's, it's like, run, Adrian, save yourself. Your family will understand, right? <laughs> it's, it's like it goes off like that. But then I give it a couple of seconds and I, I come back in the house and I, I get back into bed. No, I haven't run out of the house, I promise. And I say to myself, oh, it's just his sense of light. A cat could sense that off, a moth just leaves blowing past it on a windy night, you know, etc., etc. No one's creeping around outside. But then the other night, about three o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by this startlingly loud bang inside our house. And I thought, someone has really got in this time, right? So I'm like, Heather, go and get them, right? <laughs> And so, bang, I could feel the adrenaline coursing through my body. And then I stopped and I remembered that I live with the noisiest person on earth in the form of my third daughter, right? Who, for some reason, will think at three o'clock in the morning, now would be a good time to disassemble my bed because I want to move it somewhere else, right? <laughs> I love her, but sometimes I'm like, why are you doing this? <laughs> Are you doing this? So that's what the prefrontal cortex does, right? The amygdala goes, bang, danger. But the free prefrontal cortex will go, hang on a second. There's probably a logical, rational explanation 
for this. You know what I'm talking about, right? It begins to talk us down off the ledge. But here's the thing. This rational part of our brain that can stop us panicking can also give us good reasons to be anxious. Has anyone experienced that? It can give us good logical reasons to be anxious. So we're not just panicking anymore and having that fear response. We're now, we've now stopped. We've stopped panicking, but now we're, we're thinking about reasons to actually be genuinely worried. So when we were on our last holiday, Heather, myself and my two youngest girls, we're on the last leg of our trip. We were in Italy, we were in Rome, and it was our second last night. And we were sitting in a piazza, which was just around the corner from where we were staying, having drinks before dinner, just people watching, taking it all in, you know, just really enjoying ourselves, just soaking it all in. And a text goes off on my phone. And it's from the airline. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I open it up, and it just says, your flight, you know, blah, 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 from, from Fimacino to Sydney has been cancelled. And I'm like, but that's like 36 hours away. So I went into panic mode because I'm kind of the, I'm the guy who takes responsibility for organising all of this. I've never had this happen before. I've never had a flight cancelled. So I just went, well, what are we going to do? You know, we're never going to be able to get home. And Heather and the girls are like, it's fine. We'll just get it sorted out later. And, I'm, and So I began to stop panicking. But the problem was I needed to ring the airline to sort this out. But I couldn't ring until 9 o'clock Australian time, which was 1 o'clock Rome time in the morning. And so we went out for dinner, and the whole time that we were out that night, I'm going through every single feasible and unfeasible reason why this isn't going to work out, and everything that could go wrong, and how are we going to fix this, and what are we going to do, and I wonder if I should go and just buy different tickets with a different airline, etc., etc. So I spent literally hours. We went home, we went to bed, Heather went to sleep like that, right? I just lay there like... Okay, 11 o'clock. It's five past 11. I, I stayed there until one o'clock. And then I rang them and I said, hey, our flight's been cancelled. Like, yeah, we can see this. Um, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, obviously, I still want to come home. So could you... Yeah, and they said, oh, do, 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 do. how about this, this flight from here to here? Sure. It was fixed in 30 seconds. But I've spent the entire night at dinner, in bed, probably five or six hours of just rehearsing disasters over and over in my mind. Can anyone else relate to any of that at all? Or is that just me? Right, that's just me? Or oh, I'm going to go, okay. This part of our brain can, can actually give us reasons to be anxious. Logical, not far-fetched reasons, logical, good reasons to be worried about things. It's not enough for us to squelch panic only to land up in anxiety, right? It's not enough to squelch panic only to end up in anxiety because God doesn't want us to just not panic. God wants us to be free from worry and anxiety as well, yes? He wants us to have peace and not be constantly turning and churning over things in our mind. And look at what Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, 7. Can you pull that up, please, Kira? Now, remember, this was written by Paul while he was in prison, chained to guards, awaiting his possible execution. His, cert his future was very, very, very uncertain. Odds on he was going to be killed. And so this is what he writes. So this guy is smoking what he's selling, right? Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This isn't just about calming ourselves down and then we're left with the responsibility of trying to work everything out. This is about having the presence of mind to understand that we are able to to hand things over to God that he will take care of, things over which we have no control, to hand those things over to God and to simply leave it with him. And so part of the function of our rational brain 
as Christians, as people who read our Bibles and we listen to messages and we sing songs about this, part of our rational brain should say to us, once we've stopped panicking, when it comes to the stuff over which you have no control, Adrian, or insert name here, you can hand that over to God because, here's a fact, you have a God who loves you, who cares about you, so much so that even the very hairs on your head are numbered. You matter to Him. What matters to you matters to Him. There is nothing impossible for this God. So you don't need to spend your time worrying about how this is all going to work. You can hand it over to that God who not just invites us, he commands us. In Peter, it says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, right? That's what our brain can tell us. When we feel like that we want to get on that, that anxiety roundabout and just go round and round and round and round, we can tell ourselves, we don't need to do that. Instead, we can hand this stuff over to God, the stuff over which we have no control, and we can leave it with him. And you know what? You know what's been found? This is where, again, science and scripture agree with one another. It has been found that when we pray, it not only connects us with the heart of God, it actually changes the structure of our brain. Did you know that? If you pray for 12 minutes a day, they've actually done tests on this. It shows people's, are brain, people's brains are restructured for the better. So just as fear and negative thoughts rewire our brain and reshape our brain to run in those old ruts and grooves that we've been talking about, prayer begins to heal and to transform and to cut new paths in our brain. And remember, this is all about renewing our minds, okay? It is about winning the war for our mind because this is where the battles are won and lost, in our minds. Now, Paul says there is a don't do and a do. First is don't be anxious. Take that thought captive before it runs away. But it's not, a, it's not enough to simply not do. I don't know if you've ever been around anyone who's like this. I've, I've been this person in the past, but sometimes people would say things to me, usually my family would say things to me like, I'm worried or I'm scared or I'm uncertain. And I would just like tap in deep to the wisdom within me and go, don't be. How helpful is that? Have you been on the receiving end of that one before? Where you actually say to someone, I'm just so scared about this. And someone says, oh, don't be. Well, thank you. Do I, where do I pay? Uh, uh, over here, right? Simply being told not to do a thing is, is part of the equation, but it's not enough. Just refraining from something is enough. We also need something active to do in its place. If we're not going to panic and worry and be anxious and freak out all the time, then what are we going to do? So Paul says, don't be anxious, but instead, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, right? That, that invitation is actually incredibly comprehensive. One word, in one translation, it says, in everything, in every situation, in everything, and again, Everything in Greek means the same as it does in English. Everything. Because here's what we need to, to actually get our minds around and remind ourselves about. When God says everything, he means everything because there is nothing too big and there is nothing too small. Everything. The entire spectrum of anything that could concern us. Sometimes we think, well, this isn't something I should bother God about. He's got too much on his plate. No, everything. If it matters to you, it matters to him. Everything. Hand it over to him. If it's a thing for you, it's a thing for him. And I love the language that Paul uses in this because the Greek word for anxious is the word, um, let me see if I can find it now, I've written it down here somewhere, mirimaneo, which means to be separated, to be torn apart, to be shredded. What that means is it's a beautiful picture of what anxiety does to us because anxiety causes us to be sort of disintegrated. I'm standing here, 
But my mind is on something way over there and over there. And my heart is over here. Do you know what I'm talking about? We are existing in all these places and we are not fully present here in this place and in this moment because we're all off over here worrying about all this other stuff. So mirror and means to be torn, to be separated. And then he says, when we pray, we get the peace of God which transcends understanding. I don't know about you, but I'm someone who likes to know the reason. I like the logic, I like the reasoning, I like the rationale for something. But Paul says this peace that we get transcends our understanding. In other words, we can, tr- we can do our best to try and explain it. But in the final analysis, this is something that kind of defies our understanding or explanation. We should technically be concerned or worried or anxious about something. But because we've given something to God and genuinely given something to God, we now have this peace and it doesn't make sense. Has anyone ever experienced that before? Where you can be in the middle of something and technically you should be beside yourself. But you're not. You just have this overwhelming sense, it's, it's going to be okay. I can't point to anything logical or rational that on the surface here that's, that, that, that tells me that that's going to be the case. I can't. There's no evidence to suggest that's going to be okay. But I just have this incredible sense of peace. This is what's promised. And the peace, the word peace here is arene. And you know what it actually means? To bind up and to put together. So our anxiety shreds us, it pulls us apart, it disintegrates us all over the place. But when we pray and we give that stuff over to God, that peace of God that transcends understanding that we can't understand, it actually binds us up. It puts us back together. It reintegrates us and allows us to be here and to be present. Not worrying about all the things over which we have no control. You know, I've genuinely met people in my life who've got a lot going on. And I mean serious. But these people genuinely come across like it's not a problem. Because they have this peace. Throughout life, they have learned that where things come up that I can't control or are too big for me, they have learned to hand this over. And they are marked by this peace that sort of transcends understanding. But then Paul goes on even further and he says this peace, you know, not only pulls us back together... It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It acts as a barrier, a preventative, defensive barrier, again, against the lies and attacks of the enemy and our own stupidity sometimes, or even the things that other people may say to us. Like, you're not worried, you should be worried. We can go, no, 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 I've handed that over to God. I I have this peace, there's nothing I can do about it. That's all there is to it. But these promises are predicated on us actually giving our stuff over to God and leaving it with him. Now, I'm someone who suffers from an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. I always feel like it's my job to solve everything, right? And some of us sitting here today may be thinking, oh, geez, look, it it sounds a bit irresponsible sometimes that when we hit something, we just sort of hand it over to God and then think, well, he's going to have to take care of it. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's talking about knowing where our responsibility stops and then God's begins, right? So it's about we do what we can do. We take responsibility for the stuff that was within our power to do something about that. The rest we then leave to God. I'm not going to walk into a test and just on the basis of having prayed that God will help me pass that test. I will study and do my best but then I'm just going to have to leave the rest up to God. I'm not going to walk into that job interview, you know, unshaven, wearing a T-shirt and stuff, because I prayed about it, right? Did you brush your teeth this morning? Nah. I prayed about it, right? No, I'm going to do everything I can to present and get that job. The rest, I'm just going to leave up to God. That may not be the best job for me, but I'm going to trust him with that. And if it is, he's going to give it to me. But I'm going to turn up and I'm going to do my part in it, right? So we've got a responsibility in all of us. In all these situations, there are things that maybe we need to do. Do them. 
It's the stuff beyond that that we've got over which we've got no control. It's just too big for us, and we just have to leave it with God. It, it, it goes like this. Can you put up the next slide, please, Kira? Do what I can do. Give God what I can't do. Trust God no matter what. That's it. Do what I can do. Give God what I can't do. And trust God no matter what. It sounds simple enough, but, but this is how things sometimes work out for us. Now, I really am going to need a volunteer for this. And I think I'll pick Nat because she just happens to be there. Nat, I want you to come up here, please. Just stand here. You are now, you're, you're pretending to be God, right? I, I, I chose you because you, you do that a lot anyway, right? But <laughs> I'm joking. Can I, just, can I just say that thing I did at the beginning about I'm going to get you up here to do an impromptu kind of thing. We were at, year, a few years ago at a conference in a room full of about 250 pastors and they literally picked Nat to come up and they did that by giving her one of the most obscure Old Testament passages you've ever heard and she had to speak on it. And you know what? She nailed it, right? And I thought, and, and she was our admin person at the time and I said to guys, I have very high standards for the people that I... I said, you know, like even our admin people, they just get up there and they just preach. They just do it. I just do all that. Anyway, I digress. So you're pretending to be God. So there's stuff going on in my life, right? And I'm anxious. And I've written it down in my, my dream diary, right? I've written it all down. And I'm like, I've got no control over this. So I come over and I go, all right, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. Yeah. You got that? Okay. You sure? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, I just want to make sure you've got that. Got it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because mm-hmm. if you're busy or anything like that, I... <laughs> Okay, look, I promise, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to leave it with you. Yeah, I can't, I can't do this, I can't carry it. Um, no, are you sure, look, there's, all, there's like wars going on and stuff and, you know, no, seriously, right? Does anyone relate to that, okay? Or, or there's another scenario that's kind of like this, you know, I've written it all down. Okay, God, here you go. It's all yours. Now, time lapse two days have elapsed, right? Things haven't happened yet. I'm just thinking that perhaps, perhaps maybe I'm better off handling this after all because it's been two days now and I haven't, yeah. So I think I'll just, yep, okay. Does anyone relate to that one? Okay, thank you, God. We laugh but it's what we do. And that's why I'm going to suggest that here's a little takeaway practice. It's not mine. It's from Craig Gishel, the, the, boy that, the guy that wrote the book, so I don't take no credit for this. But it's a really good practical thing to do because I, I think sometimes embodying this stuff and doing this stuff practically helps really drive home what we're actually doing. So the first is get yourself a God box. I've got our prayer box, okay? Get yourself a God box. Put it somewhere in your house. And when you go through this process of writing down the stuff that you're going to give to God, write it down, whatever. And then this is like, I'm giving this to God. I'm giving this to God. And then we leave it there. If at any point you do any of what I've just shown you then, what you need to do is you need to go to that box and you need to take it out and you need to take it back because that's exactly what you're doing when you refuse to leave it with God. Are you with me? You take it back because you've said to God for some reason, either this hasn't worked out the way I want it or in the time in which I want, okay, or I'm still stressing about it. You're still feeling anxious about it. Go and take it back because you have not yet handed it over to God. When you feel like you've actually handed it over to God and you're willing to take your hands off and you're not going to go over and over and over it in your mind again, then by all means, go and put it back in the God box. But if you find yourself again going, you know what, I'm a little bit worried about that. So I think I might just... (laughs) Right? Seriously, it's a great little practice. I've got a little one set up on my desk and it's filled with papers and I've been back and forward a number of times, all right? But it's helping me realise, you know what, when I say I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this and I've got to leave it. Because the Bible says that he's able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, right? 
His timing is not my timing. I may look out on the horizon to see what's coming or, or I might look around to see what's feasible. That's got nothing to do with anything. God is not limited by any of that. And I must learn to trust him. Is it easy? No, sometimes it's not easy. But it's our only choice if we want to have that peace that transcends understanding and that will guard our hearts and our minds and begin to renew our minds so that we can live in this world with all that it throws at us and all the anxiety-inducing stuff that it throws at us, but to live as people who have this quiet, unshakable confidence that our Heavenly Father has us and He has it and it's going to be okay. So... Let me leave this with you. What are you going to start doing today? Are you going to start doing this? Because it's a really... I can't fix my God box. Um, what are you going to start doing today to change the way you've been operating? If you have not been operating like this, if you have, congratulations, that's fantastic. But if you haven't, what are you going to start doing today? And how are you going to make sure that you keep doing it? We're going to have a time of communion now. And I think it's a great opportunity as we take these emblems the body and the blood of Jesus, the one who said, it is finished, right? The one who's been able to do, defeat death, to come back to life, to take these emblems and say, God, today I want to start learning not to be anxious, but to trust you in everything. And if there's something on your mind now, make that the time that you begin to hand that one over. Amen?